we have a quick starter um, before we uh, do the Python introduction. I just wanted to let you know um, where we are heading, what we want to do in the next next hour. And the idea is to do a false start model, meaning that we want to understand how does a false start evolve. And a false start is essentially um, the offset along a fault, right? So where you have um, the vertical offset of uh, of a fault, and this is usually displayed in this fashion. So you have a horizontal distance from zero to 80 meter. You have an elevation. And uh, for example, here you have an eight meter offset. An eight meter offset. Uh, you have plus four meters here. You drop down by uh, eight meters. And then you have um, uh, the elevation continuing at minus four meters. So this is what you call a false car, right? So um, that elevation difference um, usually when you have a false scarp, it is, um, uh, it is like a step because you have a, 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 a significant offset. And the question is, how does this step evolve through time? How does it diffuse through, through time? So how do we uh, modify uh, the top and the bottom uh, by, by linear diffusion, by, by using this equation here? So we are saying we're looking at the sediment transport along this uh, scarp here. So we are saying the V, D, T that we have in here is essentially the change of height. This is Z, uh, the elevation through time. And the way this is de uh, depicted on this figure is here that uh, the green line is T equals zero. So the initial condition right after an earthquake, for example, or when you have formed a marine terrace. And um, these are then the time steps, uh, you know, um, uh, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years later. So these are then the, uh, the time steps. So this is how our elevation, our Z changes uh, through time. And it, is, and it changes by sediment transport along the profile. So that's, um, um, that's what the one-dimensional linear diffusion is. We are actually using a, a two-dimensional linear diffusion. So we allow diffusion to occurring also not only along the profile, also sideways, if the, if the gradient is there. And, you know, I can't draw it on this, this map, but you, you know what I mean, right? So that, um, OK, so this is where we want to go. Um, so uh, the way I prepared this is that if you look on the GitHub page, I updated it this morning. Um, if you look into the GitHub page, um, uh, and you click on LEM for landscape evolution model. I'm waiting till you guys have the, uh, the laptop and stuff uh, uh, set up. No worries. So when you click on LEM for landscape evolution models, um, uh, you see uh, um, a file that is called landlab falscarp linear diffusion.py. This is something that I prepared, and that's something that we will work through. There are other files in there um, that we will do later. For example, we will do a diffusion model on a Gaussian hill, and we do stream power model on a Gaussian hill, but now we do a simple land lab false scarp linear diffusion.py. So that's the model, or that's the Python code that I prepared, and we will walk through it step by step. 
but instead of you guys typing it all in, I think it's easier if you follow along with an existing code, okay? So if you download this, the linear diffusion, and you open it up in your uh, spider environment, and I'm just trying to see why this doesn't. Should I, should I change this to um, to dark and is this better or white uh, black font on white background is better? What is easier to read? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, maybe. Okay. Is this better? Yeah, right. This is. Okay, are there problems loading the code? Is that working out? Do you need more time to get the code? The for landlab underscore falstarp underscore linear diffusion dot pi. So I'm making this big enough and then I would like to ask you some of the things. So if you have been able to load this, I just want to explain what you what you see here. So in the beginning, uh, you know, just information about uh, who created this code. And um, the nice thing about Pi, uh, the spider editor is that you can make different cells, meaning that you can generate cells that you can run each separately, like a code block, a code of 10 or 20 commands. And you start a cell, with that tic-tac-toe sign and then percent percent. So every time you do this, um, you, have, you generate a cell. And then you can run this cell by uh, clicking on this button up here, for example, run current cell or run current cell and then jump to the next cell. So this is a really nice thing if you have certain parameters that you set and that you just would like to rerun and not the entire code, then you uh, put things into cells. And uh, this is what I've done here. If I, I have all the import uh, 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 modules that we need, I have this in the first cell, and then the, the actual code that generates the model is in the next cell, because I only need to import this one, but I, I, I would want to run this 10 times or 100 times the code down here, okay? So up in here, I'm doing the uh, the importing the modules in the same fashion as we did yesterday. I want NumPy, the numerical Python, and I want the ability to plot. So this is uh, the first two commands. And now I'm going to load uh, uh, 
modules and components from LandLab. And from LandLab, um, using the raster model grid. I explained at the beginning, right, you can have hints or rasters, um, and this is a raster model grid. We do it very simple on a raster model grid. And um, um, LandLab, LandLab has all the different uh, models in uh, the components. So if you look at the web page of LandLab components, it lists all the components, green power, uh, landslide component, vegetation component, diffusion component, and so on, and so on. Um, right now, I am just uh, importing uh, the diffusion component, and I'm importing, in fact, if I'm moving over here a little, I'm just importing the linear diffusion. So I'm just saying uh, I'm using a linear diffusion model. We could also use something more complicated, but let's start out with a linear diffusion model. That's essentially uh, the numerical approach to what you know, that equation that we have over there. Um, uh, then I'm importing an opportunity or a way to plot the, the um, uh, land lab grid, meaning that I'm importing um, uh, um, a way to display the grid. That's like an image show command. Um, and uh, uh, two more options for displaying data. So this is just um, uh, the way to set up the environment that we need. When we want to use a different component, we would include it here. For example, Fastgate is one of the uh, additional components, Green Power uh, and other things. But we do this later. OK, you can uh, run this. And I'm just clicking this Run Current Cell and go to the next one. And then you see here that it runs the cell 0. This is this cell. This is cell 0. And now it, the cursor jumps to the next uh, uh, and now um, I'm going to talk about the model setup um, uh, that we are doing. Um, everybody with me so far? OK. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell uh, LandLab um, uh, the size of the grid that we want to generate. You know, we can. Um, this is essentially reserving the memory. Um, so we generate a raster model grid, and we generate it with 100 times 100 uh, uh, rows and columns. So um, um, I just use, like to use n as a number of uh, rows and columns. So I'm saying it um, 100, 100. So I'm um, uh, defining a new raster model grid with 100 and 100 cells, and each cell um, is a meter apart. So this is a spatial resolution uh, that I'm giving. You know, if we would say we have 100 and 100 cells at one meter step size, we essentially have a 100 times 100 meter area. Um, if we would say um, 0.1 here, we would have a 10 centimeter resolution. Okay? If we would say 30 here, then we have um, um, uh, um, a 3 kilo, 3, 3,000 um, uh, meter resolution, uh, 3 by 3 kilometers. Okay, so you define the resolution with this, and you define it in the way that you think is appropriate. So, for example, if we are going to model a mountain range, we would not do this at one meter spatial resolution. Right? We probably would use a thousand here or something, or a thousand meter. Um, but since we are doing a false scarf, uh, where we know that we maybe talk about something that is only 50 meters long, um, I'm just using a one meter spatial resolution. Okay. So it's really important to set the spatial resolution properly because the linear diffusion depends on that length scale, right? So you need to set this, uh, you need to set this properly. And then I'm um, writing this in MG, and I'm just, just MG is just model grid, okay? It's just short for model grid. So I'm generating a model grid um, with n equals 100 times 100 uh, uh, grid points. Um, okay, so you know I can select those two. And then um, with F, F9 or with one uh, selected or current lines, I have now generated uh, my MG. And if you would type MG here in the uh, 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 box down here, you get information about it. I can try to make it a little bigger. So MG now tells me that I have a raster model grid with the spacing and with the coordinates of the lower left. Okay? So that's just the. The, the empty framework that we set up. And then 
uh, we are going to initiate the first deal. And um, I just like to use Z for height because that's the general convention. And I'm saying, um, okay, in, in our model grid, I want to add zeros. I want to make my model only zeros. Um, and I'm saying it, um, um, uh, um, I want to write it into the notes. Um, um, and in the notes, um, uh, I call the topographic elevation. So this is the defined term uh, for, um, uh, for the linear diffusion and for the uh, 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 stream power loss. They look for the topographic underscore underscore elevation, which is essentially uh, the, 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 the information about the height. You could call that anything you want. You could that all, call so, uh, um, anything else, but you are interested in topographic elevation. You have different nodes, for example, vegetation, vegetation cover, rainfall, runoff. There are many other information that you can store. Right now, we are just uh, setting at every node the topographic elevation. And the topographic elevation at every node um, uh, would be a zero. Okay? Um, and uh, then uh, as a next step, so if I'm running this, um, I have set it to zero. And as the next step, I am uh, setting the boundary. And um, these are the, the ways, let me see how I do this. This is a way uh, to uh, make the sides, all four sides of the model domain either open or closed. Um, the, way I'm, the way I intend to set up the model is um, that I'm saying that my, um, if this is my model domain, my uh, 100, times 100, I am intending to put a false scarp at y equals 50. And um, I want to make sure that this side is closed. This side is closed. This side is open. OK? So I, I essentially, um, this is my false scarp. I allow things to go up and down, in and out, at the, at the top bottom. I close it at the side, OK? We can play around with this later, but this is the way that we are setting it up right now. So I'm saying right is closed through, left is closed through, top is closed false, bottom is closed false, OK? I'm just, I'm just uh, allowing um, uh, flux to go out, in and out here. And the reason why I'm doing this is, I'm interested in the false scarp um, diffusion in this direction. And if I'm leaving this open, I would get diffusion in this direction as well. But you know, I don't want this right now, OK? So this is why I'm keeping this closed. Um, OK, so this will be the, uh, uh, the, the boundaries. And now I'm uh, generating the false scarp. And um, uh, I'm identifying the index where I want to have the false scarp, and I want to have it at uh, 50 meters. So again, this is 0 to 100. And I'm saying at y50, uh, I'm having uh, my uh, uh, false scarp. I'm, uh, I'm essentially. Um, lifting, so everything is zero, right? We set everything to zero. Um, these are 100 zeros, these are 100 zeros. I'm essentially selecting all pixels where y is larger than 50. This is uh, this command, numpy, where the y node is larger than uh, 50, right? So I'm selecting everything that is from 50 to 100, and then I'm uh, uplifting this by 100 meters. Uh, I'm sorry, by 10 meters. So I'm just saying, okay, you know, this is my artificial false scarp that I'm generating. You know, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, actually, this goes 0 to 100. I did this wrong. Yeah, 0 uh, to 100. So everything here, I'm uplifting by 10 meters. 
if you want to uplift it more, you don't write uh, 10, you write 100 here, or whatever the, the, the offset is. This is short for uh, uh, Z up throw notes equals Z up throw notes plus 10. So that uh, plus equals is just a short version. Um, instead of writing this, I could also write, let me copy this here. So these two lines are the same, okay? Um, this line is the same as this line. This is just a short version of saying um, this is equals this plus 10, okay? Um, um, it's just a short version. It's just a nice uh, uh, convention uh, to do that. Okay. Um, so let's do this. And and I, I always like to have, um, uh, okay, uh, we could also just, then let's just view the grid. Um, so if I'm now going to view the grid, this is uh, the commands that we're down here. Oops, why is it always showing the weird help? Okay, so now I'm viewing the grid, and uh, this is my, a model grid that I'm having. Uh, this is 50, right? We said from 50 to 100, we want to have elevation 10, and everything else has elevation zero, right? So you can envision this is essentially a block um, where this part is 10 meters higher than the, than the part below, okay? You see a black line here and a black line here, which means this is a closed boundary. No mass can go in and out here. I always like to work with profiles, so um, uh, we can generate a cross section, and I would like to create a cross section um, here uh, uh, along the y-axis. You know, so I just wanted to draw a profile uh, across uh, uh, across this uh, this false start, and uh, the cross cross section uh, can be generated in this way that we are. Um, uh, this is our original cross section um, where we uh, essentially convert our z value um, to uh, um, so the, the the command node to vector vector to raster essentially converts our model domain back into uh, a raster. So the the tricky thing now the way how LandLab does the modeling is it does not store this as an array. LandLab stores the all, ele all elevation information as a long vector, as a long line, because from a computational perspective, it's much, much easier to work with a vector, one long vector, instead of an array. Yeah? So internally, LandLab stores this as a long vector. So it, it essentially puts all, all lines, uh, all rows uh, um, um, behind each other. So when you want to draw a profile, you first need to convert that long vector back into an array. And this is essentially what this command node vector uh, does. It, it allows you to bring it back into, into an array. And um, uh, what this command here is doing, it, uh, uh, it takes, so this, if, if I'm just running this, um, it takes, it essentially uh, plots the entire array, um, our, our NumPy array, and I just want to select the middle part of it. And um, um, I'm just saying uh, that it should take uh, the number of, of, of pixels um, divided by two, which is half of the, 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 the array, and I'm, then I'm rounding it, and I'm converting it to an integer. Um, so essentially when I'm running this, once for the uh, um, elevation profiles and once for the um, Z profiles, I'm having now two vectors that go right in through the center of the, uh, of the array. And I can uh, plot this, and I can plot this uh, by using um, the uh, uh, cross-section as the Y-coordinate, 
um, uh, uh, the, the elevation information. I plot it in a black color with a width, line width of three, and I give it a label, and I add the X label and the Y label and a title to the plot. So if I look at this, I now have um, the distance along the profile. So I'm going from, uh, from here, from zero meters, up to here, here I have this jump by 10 meters. I'm going from zero to 10 meters, and I'm now at the part that has been uplifted, okay? Yeah, so this is the profile across, 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 across this part. And now we have set up the model, and now we can uh, perform linear diffusion. Now we can see how does this fall start um, evolve through time if we allow some diffusion, diffusion coefficient and if we uh, assume a, a certain number of time steps. Okay? Um, so next uh, we need to uh, initialize the diffusion coefficient and um, this is here our, I'm, I'm saying our my linear diffusivity is 0.01 square meters per year. So I'm running the models in year time steps, yeah? Um, and I'm just saying, um, for my model domain, I'm allowing 0 0.01 square meter per year to move downward. That's a centimeter. So I'm saying essentially, the, the area of my soil um, can move downward by one centimeter per year. Um, that's an, it's an average value. Uh, it's not fast and it's not slow. It's an average value for a diffusion coefficient. You can have uh, very humid areas. You can have uh, diffusion uh, coefficients of 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters per year, where you move your soil by this much per year. And if it's very, very dry, uh, maybe you move it a millimeter or even less. So then the diffusion coefficient would be much uh, lower. Yeah? So this is something where you need field data for, or where you need information um, uh, what your diffusion coefficient is. And then I'm uh, um, telling, so I'm defining the diffusion uh, coefficient, and then I'm setting up uh, the linear diffusion model, and I'm telling um, uh, LandLab that for the grid MG, for our modeling grid, we allow linear diffusion. So that command here, um, that command linear diffuser um, tells LandLab, okay, for the grid MG, I want to do linear diffusion. Um, uh, so this is, and then for the grid MG, I allow a diffusivity coefficient of that um, 0.01 that we, that we define, okay? So the reason for doing this this way is that um, you can add different uh, models uh, to your grid MG. You can say you allow linear diffusion, landscape eroder, landsliding, and so on. You can add this to your grid this way. Right now, we only allow the linear diffusion, okay? And uh, then I'm um, uh, saying um, I don't want to use annual time step. I'm doing time step of 100 years. I could use a thousand years or 10 years too. And the reason is, you know, with one centimeter uh, uh, movement, uh, in, in 100 years, at least I get a meter movement, right? Um, so I'm saying I'm, I'm running the, the model in time steps of 100 years. But this is, again, this depends on the problem. If you're interested in microtopographical changes and so on, you may do this at the, at the decadal scale. Right? right now, we are interested in a fault scarp that is evolving probably over hundreds to thousands of years. Okay? So this is the time scale that we're using. So our time step DT is 100. And then I'm saying, um, uh, uh, now I'm using a, uh, a, a for loop, but let's ignore the for loop for a second. Let's look at this guy here. And um, the way you do linear diffusion is if you say you have defined LD is your linear diffusion model on the grid MG. If you want to do one time step um, or one step, essentially a hundred year time step, 
you just say ld dot run one step. So this now does one diffusion step um, worth 100 years. Okay? So if you, if you just run uh, this, if you put it in a for loop, uh, meaning uh, it now runs 25 times, which means that you model it over 2,500 years. Okay? And every year you also, every 100 years you also would save, or you could save the, 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 the model output if you're interested in that. You know, instead of, um, instead of writing uh, the for loop, maybe that is too confusing. Um, uh, uh, you could also just say, you know, um, and then you're not doing LD1 time step. You could also say times 25. If you do this, then you would do one model time step um, for 2,500 years. But you would not know how it evolves in between. You just get one time step, okay? But if you want to see how your profile evolves through time, how it is smoothing out and getting um, smoother and smoother, you want to uh, 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 do it in, 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 in several steps. Um, you know what? Just for the sake of it, I'm going to run this. I'm not going to run the for loop. I'm just going to run one step. Okay? I'm do just going to do one step and then I'm plotting uh, the new landscape. And here I'm um, so this is what it would look like after a hundred years. And um, this is the original landscape, right? That, that clear break. And a hundred years later, you see that the elevations have, uh, that the edges have been, uh, have begun to smooth out, right? The, the edge, uh, the top edge, um, saw the bird coming at me, man. Um, uh, uh, the edges started to go from 10 uh, to 9, 8, 7, and so on meters. So in other words, we are starting to smooth this out, right? Um, so we now seeing that this is a, this is the diffusion uh, that is taking place. Yeah, and we can also take a uh, take a, a profile. It's now being done here. So the profile of oops. Uh, that's the other way around. Let me just uh, um, flip this. Hold on a second. Um, Okay, so what you see here is what your false curve would look like with those modeling components after a hundred years. This is the original false curve, the black line, and you see how that blue line uh, starts to show the diffusion, right? How the edges become less sharp. And in map view, this would look like this. And the diffusion only occurs, can, you know, these are the only uh, open, uh, open borders. You cannot uh, do it left or right. Okay? So let's go back. What would happen if we run the for loop? If we say uh, we don't do it um, uh, uh, one step, um, we are now doing it 25 times, times 100 years, okay? So if we do this, um, you know, again, this is really nice and fast. Uh, and if we do, uh, if we look at this, um, we see landscape that looks then again smoother, okay? So after 2,500 years, you see that, it, you know, it becomes much smoother, right? Uh, the, the curve is uh, being, uh, or there is more material diffused uh, downslope. You have deposition occurring here, here erosion, and your profile uh, also 
uh, uh, starts to look uh, smoother, right? So you, you know, you remove the edges, the sharp edges, right? Um, okay, my suggestion is that we uh, play around with this for the next five or ten minutes and that I want you to do two things. I want you to change the diffusion, diffusion coefficient, so right now from one centimeter uh, to ten centimeters per year, or ten square centimeters, so 0 0.1 square meter per year, okay? And uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, start thinking about the time step. So, you know, what if, if you change the time step? And if you are very interested, if you may also consider um, uh, changing the uh, uh, spatial resolution of the model. Yeah? So, what would happen if you set this to uh, two meters, for example? You know, um, um, then uh, it would be a little coarser. Okay, and and the idea is that uh, we then talk about this um, uh, uh, in ten minutes or so, and, and I'm happy to walk around and help you if you uh, if you need need help. But I want everyone to be able to run this simple example because it's a you know linear scarp fault modeling is a diffusion modeling is you know, a nice thing to do. So if you need help or something, raise your arm and I can, your hand and I can, I can help. Okay, uh, um, so the reason for that is, is that um, I accidentally say flip vertically twice, which means you're rotating it twice. So you need to remove one of them. Maybe you remove this guy. Uh, just put vertically, yeah. And the comma needs the comma needs to go here. Okay, now run it. Now run it. Yeah, there we go. And then I, I also would see it go can you go to uh, uh, go to projects? No, I'm sorry, tools, preferences, I Python controller, and graphics, and not inline, but automatic. Uh, yeah, you apply. Okay, and now you need to close this, you need to reclose this. And then uh, you just, uh, um, uh, if you go up, you just run this again. And uh, no, the, the, the whole, if you go up all the way, no, uh, you have to run the whole thing again. You click in here, you click on this guy. Okay, and this is what I wanted to do with you. In other words, um, uh, we are running a for loop here where we run it 25 times. And now the idea would be how can we store every time we do a time step, how can we store what the profile would look like? So that instead of, instead of having an output plot uh, that shows the first and the last model run, we want to have it evolving, right? How does it change to time, okay? So um, uh, we can do that by uh, uh, generating, oops, by generating, um, uh, or uh, um, saving a profile every for loop. So every time we run the for loop, um, we we generate a profile and we save that in a separate variable. Okay, and then at the very end, um, um, we can plot that. Um, okay, so uh, uh, um, you know what? I'm I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to create a new one.
uh, I'm going to do this and um, uh, I will also upload this then to uh, to GitHub. I'm just um, setting up uh, the modeling world. I'm deleting all the stuff that I don't <coughs> necessarily need. And Um, okay, so what we need to do is, so beer with me, I need to do this uh, uh, online here, and I'm going to uh, uh, upload this as well. And um, I'm, before we can run this, uh, I have to uh, generate uh, an empty array. So I need to tell Python where I want to save uh, 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 my data, okay? So uh, before I can write into an array in Python, I need to tell Python create an empty array, and then I can save data in there. Um, uh, so this, that usually means allocation. So I'm allocating the memory uh, uh, for this. And, um, 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 allocating the memory uh, for uh, a variable uh, that has um, that is empty. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, creating an empty variable, and I'm giving uh, the variable the, the the size of the uh, array that I'm creating, and I'm creating. Uh, the numbers of time steps, in this case 25, but you can also do 50 time steps, you can change that, so this is why I'm keeping this as a variable, so you only need to change one number. Um, and um, I'm having the length of the previous cross-section as the length of um, uh, uh, the numbers of points that I'm saving every time, so 100 uh, times. Um, so I'm creating an empty array uh, for the uh, 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 cross section, and um, uh, creating an empty array for the uh, y axis. So the y axis is um, uh, the y coordinates here. Yeah, because we want to uh, save the y coordinates every time step too. So now I'm having two uh, uh, two arrays. One is called cross section center LD. LD stands for linear diffusion, and the other is called cross section center Y coordinate LD. And if I look at this, uh, this is now filled with meaningless numbers. And if I would uh, look at the size of this, um, why is this? Uh, if I look at the shape. Of this, it, it now ha is uh, 25 elements long, or I have 25 rows uh, and 100 columns. And if for every time step, for every for the first row, I'm saving the profile in 100 uh, uh, um, in 100 uh, columns. For the second time step, I will be writing in the profile and so on. So I'm I'm first allocating this and. Um, um, you need to allocate it, otherwise uh, uh, Python needs to allocate the memory with every for loop and it becomes really, really slow because then the, the array grows every for loop and that makes it really, really slow. So it's much faster to pre-allocate this, to tell Python in advance, I know the size of the uh, 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 memory that I need to allocate, so please allocate it and then um, I can write into it. And the way you access it is that I'm now saying for the cross section, um, uh, um, I want to write at the east iteration. So I'm at iteration um, uh, i, um, and uh, for that iteration i, I want to write uh, the profile. Yeah, and uh, at the end I will have an array uh, that has this. Uh, 
uh, um, it contains all all these uh, uh, points. So, and let me do one thing here. I'm actually uh, plotting this um, right away. Um, I am going to not this. Let me just check for a second, okay? Um, Give me a second here, okay. Um, okay. Okay, nice. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I, I will upload the code in a second, okay? And then, then I then I explain it. I just wanted to show you what the product product will look like. I now changed the time step to 250 years and I'm doing it uh, 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 25 times. This is the initial condition, the black line, and then you see how through time the false curve is evolving. Every one of this line, every single of this line is another 250 years, another 250 years, and so on. And, and you know, we could also now do, uh, we could also now uh, say that we do it, yeah, 250 years, we do uh, 50 uh, time, st time steps. Uh, you know, then you get, eventually many more many more models let me save this and now let's hope that uh, uh, that I figure out how I do uh, how I submit this So if you go to the LEM directory, yeah. So the file land lab false carb linear diffusion now has been updated 32 seconds ago. So meaning <laughs> it's the file that it, I just uploaded. And, and then if you download this, it contains uh, uh, that additional code that uh, uh, we just uh, uh, looked at. And I just wanted to spend a few more minutes talking through it while you maybe uh, uh, download it, okay? So you have access to the code. Um, but so the way, the way we do this is that we, uh, up in here, um, we again define our modeling grid. We define the linear diffusion with whatever linear diffusivity you want to have. I saw that some of you did 0.1 square meters per year and so on, and you see that things get smoother right faster after time because you have a higher uh, diffusion. Here now I'm using a time step of 250 years. But again, you set the time step that is most applicable for your setting. Um, and then I want to do it 50 times, okay? So I'm setting uh, the time steps to 50 uh, 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 times. And then I'm creating the empty uh, arrays, the empty arrays that store each of the profiles. Uh, these are empty. And then I'm doing a first figure plot. In that first figure, 
I'm plotting the original profile, that uh, step size profile, right? And I'm doing it with a line width of three, and I'm doing it in a black color, okay? Um, and that's essentially our original topography. That I plot that first, and then I start the for loop. In the for loop, I uh, convert my, uh, my uh, uh, I extract the profile, the cross-section uh, elevation profile into the cross-section Y profile, and then I'm plotting it right away. So every for loop, I'm plotting into the same figure, and I'm plotting into the same figure um, with the line width of one, meaning uh, I use thinner lines and I'm using a blue color. Okay, so these are the blue lines that, that I have. And then I run the, uh, then I run the, the model, one step. And in the next for loop, uh, I'm running the, uh, in fact, I think it would be smarter to do it the other way around, meaning that uh, you first run the model, one step, and then you, you, you plot it. But, uh, you know, at this time, uh, the outcome would be very, very similar. So this would be the, the 50 time uh, time step. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, you see how things get smoother and smoother through time. Okay? Is everybody at least somewhat comfortable doing this linear SCARP diffusion modeling? You know, I, I think it's actually pretty exciting. And you know that there's a whole science of um, Oscar dating, right? There are people literally that travel around the world to measure the topography of Oscar. And by the way how it has been smoothed, you can date those Oscar. So you essentially you do reverse engineering of this. You measure this profile and then the blue curve. Then you know the diffusivity coefficient. And you, you think you know it. And then you back translate how old that fault scarf must be. Okay, so there is, especially you do that in California, and we do it, did it in, um, in, on, in the Himalaya, there are many people, not on the Himalaya, in Tibetan Plateau, along the Kunlun Fall, we did it in, in um, the Central Andes. So these are things, fault scarf dating is a very typical thing that you do if you want to know how old a, a, a rock is. Yeah, that's, that's just tectonic. Um, okay. Um, uh, um, I could envision what the deal now. We have some more time. Uh, how much? 20, 30 minutes? Uh, good. I would like to do two things. And one thing is um, uh, you change the boundary conditions. You run the same model, maybe the first simple model, where you, uh, where you open it up on the side. Okay? So um, you do right is closed false and left is closed false. So in other words, you you're running the model by allowing it to be open left and right. So just a quick note here, if you open the, uh, the boundaries left and right, so this is our original model run, right, where we have all the transport only along the y direction. Nothing is allowed to go out east or west or left or right. If you open up those boundaries, you see that the resulting uh, effect also has diffusion going out uh, on the side, right? And we, we don't want it, at least for the simple model domain that we are setting up. Maybe you want it because you're in a different setting then, 
but for the setting that we first defined as we closed those. And now you see that diffusion also occurred in the, in the other direction, right? But um, we, 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 we prevented this by setting the boundaries um, too close. So this is the reason why you set the, 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 the boundaries uh, close uh, to avoid those artifacts. Yeah? One more thing that I wanted to point out. And, uh, you know, we just used one of the simplest models set, set up in the way that we had a linear fault going through the center of our VM. Usually it's not that straightforward, right? Usually you have some kind of, of an um, uh, oblique fault in there. So uh, uh, this is where um, I just briefly wanted to let you know that you can, of course, also generate diagonal faults. It doesn't need to be, you know, you don't need to have a fault that looks like, that looks like, uh, uh, that looks like a line. You can also, or that looks, that is parallel to the grid. You can also have a, have a fault uh, that runs obliquely, okay? So you can also have a fault that runs like this through your, uh, through your terrain, okay? And, now, because most of the times faults don't align with our map, right? <laughs> they run in a different direction. So, uh, so uh, you can uh, create diagonal faults um, uh, uh, in the fashion. I think it starts at line 134. And uh, the way you set this up is that when you have your fault y command here, you're multiplying the coordinates uh, with an x coordinate. That essentially means that if you go one step uh, along the x coordinate, you're changing uh, your y coordinate more, right? So this way you're adding you're adding a, a, a different slope. Right. So if we if we do this, then yeah, this is for example a, a way how you can create a a, a fault. Uh, here with the 0.25, that's essentially the slope, meaning that every x step, um, I'm going 0.25 uh, times the x step up on the y coordinate, right? So that means that I'm adding a constant slope to the y coordinate, which means that with every x step that I'm going, that I'm increasing, my y becomes uh, bigger and bigger and bigger too, right? Before we set up, we set, we had our fault equals 50. Meaning uh, this was a line because there was no function of x. Now we are adding um, uh, the x coordinate times 0.25, um, meaning that uh, um, we are adding a slight slope to our line, and now we have a fault that runs about here. Okay? Um, if you change that 0.25, you change the slope. So essentially, um, changing that is a slope, right? Um, you. And running uh, this uh, again a hundred times would then a hundred times um, running it twenty five times for a hundred years um, then gives you what you expect essentially a fault uh, uh, that is diffused in this direction. You know, it's the same result as before. I just wanted to show you that you don't need to have a fault that aligns with the grid. You can have a fault that aligns uh, obliquely too, right? Um, you can get now more fancy. Often, uh, you know, we we use the setting that uh, we had a model domain, and the uh, the fault runs through the entire model domain. But you know, usually faults don't run through an, our entire map. And you know, we may have a fault that runs only through part of, of our our map, right? And then um, you would have diffusion left and right as well, right? Um, uh, so then we move away from the false scarf modeling and we more go in the direction of landscape evolution modeling. So if we have, we could, for example, say that we have a block that we uplift by 10 meters, like a rectangle that we uplift by 10 meters, and then we would see diffusion in all, uh, in all sides, right? Along all sides. Uh, maybe that could be a nice uh, exercise uh, to do. For to make things simple, let's just align our block with with the grid because it's simpler to to generate this. 
So what would you do in order to make a block? Um, let's say this is 10 by 10 pixels. And let's say this is uh, 0 to 100. Again, 0 to 100. So how would you how would you generate an array where you had somewhere in the middle uh, you would have um, a, a block upload? I don't want to hear the Python code. I just want to hear a thought for you. How if you have an array, what would you need to do in order to um, uh, uh, define an array where we have where we upload some part? Boundaries, so we could, um, um, how would we do that? We could say if we have our Z um, and we can address our pixels in Z, we could say uh, we go to 45X and 55X, right? Um, so uh, 45 uh, to uh, 55, uh, that's X, and then in the Y direction we would do the same, uh, 45, uh, to 55, and that is then the plus equals 10, right? Then we would have then we would have a block in the center of our uh, model domain. We just would uh, uplift uh, by 10 meters. Yeah. Let's see if that works. If we can do that. Um, you know what I'm doing is I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to grab this. No, where's my? I'm going to make a new file. I was going to say. I'm going to make a new file that I'm call, calling landlab block uplift.py. Okay? And um, we're doing a. And now I'm opening it up, okay, in all directions, I'm opening up the boundary condition. Um, so how would that be? Let me just see, I need to...
give me a second here, okay, I need a
Okay, so my apologies, it took a second longer. Let me explain you what I've uh, done here. Is I'm setting up um, uh, the model domain by uh, having the 100, uh, uh, sorry, making this a little bigger here, okay. Um, by having the 100 by 100, me, uh, 100, by 100 uh, pixel raster in a one meter spatial resolution, I'm keeping all, all the corners open, so I set everything to false, and in order to make my block uplift, uh, I'm using uh, the NumPy where function, which essentially sorts, sorts through all Y nodes and finds the Y nodes that are smaller than 55 and the Y nodes that are larger than uh, 45. So essentially, uh, I'm making a conditional statement, everything in Y that is smaller than 55 and everything in Y uh, that is uh, um, larger than 45, essentially between 45 and 55 in the y direction and the same in the x direction. So I then select those pixels that are stored in the center um, and I'm uplisting them by 10. The reason why this is a little more complicated is again the fact that uh, uh, LandLab internally stores everything as a long uh, vector. So um, LandLab doesn't store this as an array with x comma y. LandLab stores internally the data as a long, long vector, meaning that here you have 100, here you have 200, 300, and so on. Um, and it's being stored as a long, long vector because from a computational efficiency, when you do diffusion modeling, it's easier to work with a vector than with an array. So for us human beings, when we think uh, two-dimensional, we always need to convert it back uh, into the two dimensions, into the array. This is why we have to use the node Y and the node X, because that essentially finds the pixels where we have, um, uh, uh, where we have, um, uh, where we do the block uplift. You know, you could also do two blocks if you want to. You know, you could put one at 80 and the other at 40, and then you have two blocks that are being uplifted. You know, that's, that's, that will be, anyway, when you do this, um, uh, the outcome looks something like this. This is pretty dark. Let me see if I maybe use a different color scale. Um, It already did the modeling. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is the input model here. This is our block uplifted by 10 meters. And if I do the diffusion steps on it, of course, it's diffusing in all directions, right? It's diffusing in all directions. So out of that square, we are essentially turning it in, in into a cone eventually, right? So this is diffusing, diffusing it out. This is what this uh, uh, would look like, okay? You know, this is kind of what we expect, but it's nice to see that we can, uh, that we can model it. You know, we could now argue about if this is a Gaussian hill um, or not, and it is no Gaussian hill because um, the curvature uh, uh, does not change. Uh, uh, this, is a, this has a polynomial uh, form, right? Because it's a diffusion equation, it becomes a higher order polynom. And it, it does not have an exponential uh, uh, form the same as a Gaussian Hill, where you have an exponential form. Yeah? Um, anyway, I, I always think that's a nice example because it nicely tells you how diffusion works into, into different, uh, different directions. Um, I, I will put this code uh, uh, online as well. And, um,
So um, um, what, what's the idea now? Will we want to take a break or will we want to do one more? Will we take a break? Let's take a break, yeah? And then we, then we continue with when at, at, at 1.30 or something, right? Or, yeah? Good. And of course, then we add uplift to it and stuff. I would like to show you how you uh, can include rock uplift and then uh, uh, we generate our own uh, model for uh, a simple stream power erasure. Okay? So, but first we go back to our uh, block uplift model. So, we have uh, the, the setting that um, uh, we have um, uh, described here, right? So that we have our uh, up, uh, our block that we uh, uh, define in the center of our model domain, domain, and then we apply uh, I think what was it hundred uh, yeah hundred years uh, times twenty five, and we end up with an elevation of roughly two point something meters. So our ten meter high block has decayed down to two meters, right? Because we have not had any uh, rock uplift from the bottom, so the way to include rock uplift in that model setup is within the for loop. We would need to add additional topography um, as a as a rock uplift. So um, I updated the file on uh, the uh, GitHub page. So if you uh, look at the Land lab block uplift file, and um, you will see uh, a, a revised file. And what I have done here is um, everything is the same. You set up the model in the same way. You uh, generate the, the initial block in the center. Um, uh, you define the linear diffusivity and so on. And then um, uh, you define the rock uplift rate. And uh, um, uh, the rock uplift rate is usually measured in meters per year or millimeters per year or something, right? And I'm using here a rock uplift rate of one centimeter per year, so or 0 0.01 meters per year. So since all the other units are in meters per year, we need to have the rock uplift rate in meters per year as well, okay? <coughs> so uh, LandLab doesn't do any unit conversion for you. You need to use the correct Units and you need to convert the units into the correct uh, setting, okay? Otherwise, this won't work. There is no check, there is no one in there that checks if the units are correct. You know, you, you need to make sure that the units are correct because that's, I'm saying that specifically because 99% of uh, the uh, mistakes that I see are related to units. So, for example, and so, for example, we defined a model domain 100 by 100 with a one meter time step. But there is no one that says this is one meter. This could be one kilometer as well, right? And if this is one kilometer, uh, then that would be uh, 10 kilometers uplift, right? And then this would be not uh, 0 0.01 uh, uh, squared meter per year. That would be 0 0.0 squared kilometers per year. So. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you use the right unit. And I like to use meters and years. So that's why I keep it in meters and years. But, you know, you can do this in feet too if you want. So that's up to you. But again, there is no one that checks the unit for you. You just need to make sure that you use the correct unit. Okay, rock uplift rate is uh, one centimeter. I'm saying this here. Uh, I'm running 25 time steps. And then the way you imply a uh, continuous rock uplift is you just tell the Z node, the Z is our uh, uh, model domain, right? 
and the block uplift nodes describe that center domain, right? The ones that we uh, uh, um, defined before, and we just add the rock uplift rates times the time step that we do, right? Because we do it in time steps of 100 years. Um, each time we run the linear diffusion model, it's 100 years. We need to make sure that the rock uplift rate is scaled with this 100 years too, right? So we need to multiply our rock uplift rate times uh, uh, the numbers of years that we are running it. And then we have the rock uplift rate and we are just adding this and then we run the diffusion model, okay? So uh, doing this, if we uh, run this, <coughs> now let's compare the outputs. Okay, so essentially we here are the both of the uh, uh, model runs. This is a model run with uh, without uplift. This is a model run with an uplift rate of 0 0.01 meters per year. And, and of course, by you know, if you only look at the pattern, it of course looks the same, right? Because we can't distinguish uh, between it. But the absolute elevation is different. So now this guy where we started out at 10 meters, this guy is at 14 meters height because the rock uplift rate is higher than the mass transport, than the erosion to the side. So we actually have created topography, okay? Our rock uplift rate is higher than what we take off on the side. Um, whereas if we don't have any rock uplift rate, this guy would decay in, you know, here we use, uh, what, uh, 25 times 100, 2,500 years, um, and the fall scarp in 2,500 years has, or well, that, that little hill uh, has fairly well uh, uh, declined. Okay, so this is how you bring in uh, uh, rock uplift rates. And then if you have field measurements of rock uplift rates or something, you know, you can put the boundary conditions to what is more, uh, more realistic. Um, my suggestion is that you uh, run this model yourself for a little bit. And um, we do uh, a, a few settings, and we do the following settings that we uh, have one model run with a LD where we have 0 0.01 cubic meter per year. This is our diffusivity, right? Our diffusivity and our um, a uh, rock uplift rate um, is uh, 0.001 millimeter, I'm sorry, meter per year. So this is essentially one millimeter, right? So we have the rock uplift rate is one millimeter, and our diffusivity coefficient as a function of curvature is moving stuff by uh, roughly uh, one cubic meter, uh, one uh, uh, squared meter per year. And the, the second model setup, um, uh, we do, um, we use, um, uh, uh, we use, a, so this is essentially um, a very low or a moderately low uplift rate and a uh, moderately uh, a diffusivity coefficient. Now we do a diffusivity coefficient that is more typical of uh, dry climates. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is what we would uh, get in very uh, uh, dry environments, such as the Tibetan Plateau or something. And um, we have a rock uplift rate of, um, uh, let's say, one centimeter, okay? Um, so these are, um, uh, you know, this is at the extreme end in the sense of very low diffusivity, but a very high uh, rock uplift. Um, uh, and then the third setting, uh, that would, could be, for example, New Zealand, um, where we say we have a diffusivity of 0.05 uh, cubic meters per year. Uh, so New Zealand has a high diffusivity because of the high rainfall amounts, lots of vegetation, um, so you end up moving things very fast on the, on the, on the soils. 
and um, a rock uplift rate also of 0.01 meter per year because as we know, New Zealand is very tectonically active and we do see some of the highest uh, uh, uplift rates. So these are three settings uh, where we use that um, block uh, and we uh, uh, end up uh, comparing them um, uh, um, uh, one by one against each other so that we get a feeling for how does topography change uh, over time. I should say that probably we want to do um, uh, uh, time steps of, we want to do 10,000 years, so we want to do time steps uh, of a thousand, and um, our uh, dt is equals a uh, hundred. Okay, want to do that? Yeah. So that we are every, so we are essentially modeling uh, the Holocene. We, we are modeling, you know, throughout the Holocene. What would happen with a false scarp uh, throughout the Holocene? Okay. So let's do this in the next 15 minutes or so. And then we uh, 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 talk about it. We compare the uh, compare the results. So these are you know realistic settings from what we have from the field. And then after that we dive into the uh, the stream power modeling. So you can use the land lab block uplift from the GitHub and modify that, right? I think that's a good starting point.
with setting the, the models up. Do we want to talk about it? Is there anyone that wants to talk about it and present maybe one of the models? What you are seeing, or you need more time? More time? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. We just had some interesting discussions here. Um, uh, uh, some of you noticed that there is a um, linear correlation between uh, uplift rate and uh, diffusivity coefficient. In other words. Um, if you increase the uh, uh, uplift rate by a factor of 10, you know, you probably go from 3 meter terrain to 30 meter terrain. So some of you have generated 30 meter high uh, uh, terrain because if you let uh, an uplift rate of uh, 1 centimeter, uh, an uplift rate of 1 centimeter uh, per year with a low diffusivity coefficient generates lots of topography in 10,000 years. And then, you know, you're eroding on the sides a little. If you do the same with one millimeter uplift rate per year, then you're actually reducing the topography because the erosion rate is higher than what you're adding to it. So you go down to three meters elevation. You, you had that very nicely on the, on the plot. So um, um, the, there is a balance between uplift rate and, and erosion rate that is somewhere between the, at least for the diffusivity coefficient, uh, um, between uh, um, uh, a millimeter and a centimeter, right? So this is, um, uh, that's the range of where we would then be able to generate a steady state landscape, where the uplift is the same as, as what is being uh, eroded. Yeah? Is everybody able to run those uh, models? Yeah? Um, good. Okay. Uh, in the next, are there questions regarding uh, that exercise? So, um, you know, if, if you have, if you look at the model results, you essentially, with the high uplift rates, you're generating a cone 
you have a central part that is uplifting, uplifting, uplifting. At the same time, you're eroding to the side, so you're generating essentially a large cone. And um, if the uplift rate is lower, then you are, uh, then you are uh, lowering the overall elevation, and it gets lower and lower. There was one question, right, I now remember that, where someone asked about, uh, can we look at the differences between each time step in the grid space? And the way you would do that is that in the for loop, um, uh, you just would save the grid, uh, um, the model output at, at every time step. The same way as we can generate uh, or save the profiles, uh, we can save the model output. I can show you how this is being done as an example. Um, because this would allow you to compare uh, deposition and erosion. Let me just see. Um, so here is our, our um, uh, Fosca linear diffusion uh, setup. Um, here is where we get our grid. Yeah? So this, this command here uh, extracts uh, the grid, and then we are generating the profile. Right? Remember, we did this one or two hours ago. All you would need to do is you would need to store that array in, an, in, a, in a new NumPy array. So you can save this array every, every iteration. And then uh, uh, you would uh, have the, uh, essentially the model topography at every time step. Yeah? So you instead, so up here, we are generating uh, the, empty, uh, the empty grids, right? And here you would um, uh, generate uh, um, a model domain, you would then call this um, MGLD. We do a time step, but now uh, it needs to be, uh, what is the length of G? Uh, so now uh, uh, you're saving, and uh, now we are generating a new array, and uh, we can uh, store this directly in here, you know. So now you would have the option. Now you would store the uh, the array directly. Okay. So this is one way to look at deposition and erosion between every time step. So. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to move on from the linear diffusion model. We are coming back to it later. Um, I would like to move on and uh, do. Uh, um, uh, uh, the stream power erosion law. And I think that you heard about uh, threshold erosion uh, 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 and stream power erosion law before, right? Is that true? Right? So I think, I think Jerome has been here, right? So you must have talked about it. Um, uh, okay. So I just wanted to briefly explain and tell you how this is implemented in LandLab. There are different Stream power erosion algorithms that uh, take that concept and put it in a numerical world. Here we are relying on the fast scape stream power erosion. That's a very efficient algorithm that John Brown developed um, uh, that is specifically made for running this uh, uh, 100 or 100,000 times. So fast scape is made for computative efficiency. It's, you know, there are some. It's not the most accurate, but it's definitely the fastest algorithm out there. Because we want to do landscape evolution over million year time scales, we will be fine with the tiny little <coughs> issues that this uh, may have. <coughs> anyway, the, the, uh, the setup is, and I'm going to, <coughs> the same way as we had the diffusion equation, uh, we can uh, use the stream power law with the exception that the stream power law uh, is an empirical uh, relation, meaning that uh, it's essentially trying to mimic some of the um, uh, observations that have been done. So and the observations are we have an erosion rate. Our erosion rate is some constant. That's what is containing lithology, um, uh, climate, and so on. And uh, you have uh, an area with a power law exponent <coughs> and a slope with a power law exponent. Usually, you think about it this way. Uh, the erosion 
uh, get bigger with uh, uh, area and with slope. So in other words, if slope is increasing, clearly if the terrain gets steeper, you have higher erosion rates. And um, um, if you are at a bigger part of a river, meaning you're integrating over a larger upstream area, uh, uh, your erosion rate uh, goes up. And the question always is, how does it scale? How much does erosion rate go up when you go downstream? How much does erosion rate go up uh, when you change the slope? So those power law exponents, M and N, uh, you know, core components of the stream power law. And um, uh, by the, or by, uh, by uh, uh, standard, uh, uh, if you um, use the standard approach, then your uh, A, uh, or your drainage area, is scaled to the power of 0.5, and your slope is scaled to the power of 1. Um, uh, and uh, um, so maybe I should have said in the beginning, um, we are now away from a hill slope array. We are considering channels. So in order to have channels, we also need to have, if this is yesterday, we heard about catchment, right? What is the catchment? Uh, um, uh, so if this is our catchment, um, uh, we, are, we have to calculate uh, drainage area. So every pixel here uh, needs to have uh, the drainage area calculated. And this is being done by the flow direction calculation. Okay? So uh, for the stream power erosion to work, you need to have information about um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, flow direction. So you do flow direction and flow accumulation. And that flow accumulation essentially is the drainage area, okay? So for every point here, you know your A. And then um, for every point, you uh, have the A, you have the slope, and you apply the power law relation and you multiply it with the K coefficient. So for every point on the landscape, uh, you have an erosion value, right? And then um, uh, uh, this adds up uh, 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 together. Yeah? Uh, so uh, this uh, model implementation here from, uh, uh, from Jean Brown also allows to have some kind of a threshold value, meaning that um, uh, this is your erosion law, and people have realized, well, you know, erosion doesn't really happen always. That you need to overcome a certain threshold before erosion occurs. Um, you know, uh, we call that a threshold process. And um, so this is why the more modern implementations of the of the stream power uh, model they include a threshold. So you say um, uh, you need to overcome a stream power threshold, an SP threshold, before erosion occurs. And that may be, for example, um, uh, you know it from mountain streams. Uh, a mountain stream, when, it's, when clear water is running down a mountain stream, is usually not eroding, right? Um, only when you have sediments in there or when you have a flood, for example, is eroding. So uh, this is why you apply a threshold, that meaning that when you have a certain uh, discharge condition or certain other conditions, then you uh, uh, start to evolve. So this is the threshold that is in here. We are currently not worrying about the threshold too much. In fact, the threshold by definition is set to zero, meaning that it's always eroding. Um, but you can, you know, if you know about those conditions, you can set the uh, base of zero. Okay, who has worked with a stream power model before? Or who has um, uh, extracted steepness indices before. Uh, okay. Um, uh, maybe I spend a few more minutes talking about uh, uh, what the framework uh, for the stream power erosion law is. And the stream power erosion law is based on an observation that was made in 1957 um, uh, that uh, uh, the um, uh, that river profiles uh, generally uh, follow an exponential uh, 
that he tried. So the so-called Lynch law um, uh, describes the fact that um, if you look at distance along a channel, and this is height, uh, then a nice river profile looks something like this, okay? And that, uh, um, uh, that nice river profile uh, uh, tells us uh, uh, it's in equilibrium, and um, um, uh, essentially we can derive the slope along the line here um, as a function of distance. Um, uh, people realize pretty fast that it's not the distance, the x-axis, the most appropriate x-axis, the most appropriate x-axis is in fact um, uh, area. Because if you are in a drainage network, um, you are not uh, looking at the individual pixels as a distance, you're looking at drainage area. And it became uh, pretty uh, uh, clear that if you use drainage area and slope um, um, as the two axes, and you can extract those information from a digital elevation model, we will do that with um, uh, MATLAB in a, in a few days. Essentially, for this river, a nicely shaped river would be a linear relation in the log area, log slope plot, because if you would if you would take um, uh, the, uh, the log of, or if you take uh, the slope of it, or the, the log of the height, you would have a linear relation. So a, an exponential relation um, uh, uh, would relate into a, a log slope distance plot as a, as a linear, as a line. And if you then um, take the log of the area, uh, you essentially have a power law relation, two axes are logarithmic, where you uh, uh, see a linear relation in space. So this is a river imbalance, okay? So this is a profile imbalance, and um, we have the area and the slope here, the area and the slope, and those exponents, m and n, they can be derived uh, uh, from this curve. In other words, when we have a digital elevation model and we extract this relation, so this is, a, we can measure slope from a DEM and we can measure area from a DEM, from every, from every pixel. So uh, we could uh, determine the slope of this line, and the slope of this one line is uh, the so-called uh, m over n ratio. Yeah, this is our uh, uh, setup. So we have the ratio m over n, which are those two uh, uh, um, uh, those two exponents, and that ratio has been found to be roughly uh, 0.45 or 0.5 something along this line, and this is why you uh, often take area 0.5 and slope to the 1, because that relates then uh, to the concavity of 0.4 or 0.5. So that's the, the global average. If you take, you know, thousands of rivers globally average. If you do this for the Himalaya, it may be a little different, but the Himalaya is also not, uh, not the globe in that sense. Okay? So you can derive those M over, those M and N uh, uh, exponents to some degree, you can derive those from digital elevation models. And uh, the k the k value the k value uh, came in uh, uh, because both slope and area are independent of climate, discharge, lithology, uh, tectonic activity, and so on. So people then argue, well, we need to have some kind of a modifier in front of it. Granitic rocks erode differently than a sedimentary rock. A wet climate is different than a dry climate. So that K um, uh, is something similar to the diffusivity coefficient that we just talked about, but it is actually called the lithology and climate parameter, meaning that uh, it tells you the erosive resistivity. This is what, it, what that term is usually referred to, or the erosivity. You know, how erosive is the terrain? Uh, or, or a landscape. <clears throat> so the basic idea um, with this approach is that, um, uh, you know, this is not in that sense physical base that we uh, have um, uh, a slab of soil or something that is moving. We essentially assume there is a relation between erosion rate 
between area and slope, um, but uh, um, uh, uh, it's not an, a physical based law. You know, it's an empirical a approach that works surprisingly well, but it has no clear physical base. So um, uh, the specific stream power is a little different. Specific stream power actually is looking at the energy, energy expenditure at the surface or per unit area. That's something very different than uh, this uh, stream power erosion law, okay? That's an empirical relationship, okay? Okay, um, let's see what this does to our terrain when we make certain assumptions of, um, uh, uh, of uh, slopes and area distribution. And the way I would like to go about this is um, uh, let's do an example together and then you end up uh, playing with this in yourself a little. So I, just for the records, I put a, um, I put a, um, on the GitHub, I put a new file. Um, that I call, let me make this a little bigger, that I call uh, uh, block uplift underscore or land lab block uplift underscore FSE for fast scape eroder. Yeah, FSE is short for fast scape eroder. That is this algorithm that, that we are using. Um, um, and um, uh, we are now importing a different component. We are now importing the flow accumulator because now we are not dealing with um, uh, uh, every pixel on the landscape. Now we are dealing with rivers. So we need to determine the rivers first and we do that through flow accumulation. So we have the flow accumulator and the fast scape eroder. Those are the components. I walk you through this first, okay? And then, then, then you will be able to, uh, uh, to, to play with it. Um, because uh, there, are, there are some some setups that we do in the beginning, and the setup uh, that we do here in the beginning is um, again we have a model domain of a hundred uh, times a hundred pixels, but because uh, the fastscape eroder is meant for large large landscapes, so um, uh, we are not modeling a single fault scarp here. We are not doing modeling at the ten meter scale. We are doing modeling at the catchment scale. And that catchment can be uh, several hundred square kilometers, right? So this, this erosion law does not work on a single hill slope. So that erosion law works on an, a mountain belt scale, okay? Otherwise, um, you don't get the drainage area. You need drainage areas of square kilometers or hundreds of square kilometers, right? And if you have a single hill slope that is 10 by 10 meters large, you maybe have 100 square meters. Uh, uh, in there as a as a as a drainage area, but you need to have uh, several square kilometers until this uh, stream power erosion law uh, becomes uh, important. So um, uh, it will be uh, important to realize that now we are you know be, the linear diffusion we did before. This is something we can really do at the meter scale. Now we are talking about kilometer scale over here. Okay. Um, so for that reason, I have a hundred times 100 uh, grid, and I'm saying I have a step size of 10 meters. I could even say a step size of 50 meters here, or I could make a 1,000 by 1,000 meter grid, yeah? Uh, I'm, I'm leaving it for the, for the sake of the argument, I'm leaving it small, but it would, not, it would not make any sense to put one meter here, okay? Because 100 by 100 meter, like a soccer field, is not the size that this model can describe. Yeah, so it needs to be a mountain belt range. So keep in mind that we now have to change the, the raster model setup. So we, we create the raster model. Um, uh, we uh, create the topographic elevation. We leave all nodes open, you know, so everything can flow at the site. So there is no side scope. And then um, we are doing um, an uplifted block nodes. And I'm not doing a small little uh, block uplift. I'm using a larger block in the center of a, uh, of a larger terrain. And in fact, um, um, what I'm saying here is here, uh, everything between 150 and 850 pixels. So because we have 
um, you have 100 pixels times 10 meters, so we are going from zero to a thousand meter, okay? So this is essentially our site, and I'm going uh, from 150 to 850 meters. That's the, the block that we are uplifted, okay? <laughs> so I'm bringing this block up by 100 meters, okay? I'm, I'm not uplifting it by 10 meters. Again, we are looking at very large scales. Uh, so we are bringing this block up by 100 meters. And then something very important is that that uh, um, um, Fastscape eroder doesn't like flat surfaces, okay? So a flat surface is something that actually does not exist in the, in the real world. Um, every surface is always a little inclined or has some noise on it or something. So for that reason, um, I'm adding some random noise to it. Yeah? So I'm using the NumPy, NumPy function, NumPy random ran, and I'm generating random values, the lengths of the, uh, how many nodes I'm uplifting. And I'm scaling this random values, I'm scaling them by, by 10. So if I'm running random ran, it generates a random number between 0 and 1. Any random number between 0 and 1. And um, so I'm generating, uh, a, you know, how many numbers are, how many pixels, how many grid cells, and I'm scaling them by 10. So the values now go from 0 to 10. So to my 100 meter elevations, I'm adding anything between 0 and 10 meters just to make the surface a little rough. So I'm adding a little noise because that's more of a natural surface, you know. No surface, you know, as I said, no surface is as flat as this floor. It just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. So um, I'm, adding, I'm adding a little bit of random, random noise here. So how, what does this look like? If I'm running this part and uh, zooming in, can you, uh, you hardly can see it. I can see it on my screen. Um, I can see on my, my screen that, uh, it's not all white. And the elevations, they go roughly from 90 to 110 meters, okay? So I have, I have a little bit of, uh, of noise on, uh, uh, on there. Ah, oh, the windows are okay. Uh, let me just do one thing. I am... Um, Okay, uh, I just changed the color scale a little uh, just to make that point clear that this is our uplifted block. It goes from 150 to 850 and it has noise on it, right? It's not a flat surface. So that random noise uh, that, we gener that we generated, which means everybody of you who will run this will have slightly a different color, right? Because it's random. That, that is the random walk that I was explaining in the beginning, right? So every, every time we run this, the outcomes might be slightly different, right? Slightly different, depending on what the, what the initial conditions are. But, you know, that's just the way it is. So this is our, our block uplift, okay? And uh, next step is uh, we need to uh, determine uh, the flow accumulation. So in other words, we need to see where are rivers, where is upstream catchment area that is being accumulated uh, together. So this is what we do with a, a flow accumulator. And here we are using the flow direction of V8 um, because we are using a larger scale uh, uh, approach. If we would do a, a fine scale approach, we could use the infinity or some other um, flow routing algorithm as well. And then we are applying the fast scape eroder. The fast scape eroder is that algorithm that takes the input grid. It uh, defines some uh, uh, k value. k is a uh, evolutivity. It's usually between uh, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 5. It depends on the, uh, uh, on the lithology. So if you're in 
granitic, really, really hard rock, uh, your K value will be likely 10 to the minus 5 or something. Um, if you are in softer rocks, sedimentary rocks, um, your K values will be lower. Um, uh, I'm sorry, will, yeah, will be 1 to the uh, 10, 10 times 1E minus 3 or something. Uh, that's usually for, for, uh, for softer rocks. I said before, the ratio m over n will be 0 0.5, uh, and I'm using that same that same ratio here. So the way the model setup works is that we first need to run one step for the flow accumulation. So we need to determine the flow accumulation, and then once we have the flow accumulation grid, there is a new node being added to the to our um, uh, 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 model environment, which is then the drainage area, essentially. Uh, 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 this flow accumulation tells us the drainage area. Um, and then we run uh, the fastscape eroder on it. FSE is the fastscape eroder um, that, we, uh, that, we, that we defined here. And we say we want to do uh, 10,000 years. We do one step with 10,000 years. So now here is a step where you could, for example, introduce a rainfall pattern. So if you have a rainfall grid, or if you would like to model a rainfall grid on it, you would add a rainfall grid um, on the flow accumulator to weigh the, the flow accumulator. And then you could have, for example, or graphic rainfall or some variability in the rainfall uh, if you want to. If we run this and we look at the, the uplifted block, again, this is just one, uh, one uh, time step. You see how I'm going here. Yeah, I'm going to uh, uh, change the uh, color scale a little so that uh, the contrast is a little bigger. So, hold on. Okay, so here we have initial, initial condition, and this is uh, after the first run, uh, where we see that depending on where we had channels, uh, those channels uh, uh, start to uh, 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 erode into the into the uh, um, plateau. I, let's call it plateau. The re there is a reason why I used an uplift block because you know I I simulate it as, as a plateau. So let's look at the uh, at the uh, flow accumulation that is being uh, used here. So this is. Uh, the flow accumulation, hold on a second, I'm bringing up the other figures. Okay, so what we see here is that at the first step, um, not really any channel has formed, right? Because uh, it's all pretty noisy on the, on the plateau, so, uh, um, you know, we do have uh, uh, a few channels forming, and then wherever the channel exits, here you see those guys, uh, you start to form, uh, uh, you know, you start to incise uh, into, into the plateau margin. Yeah? So this was a single step. Now, what does it look like if we uh, do this multiple times? And. Uh, Now I'm doing this um, uh, 100 times, 100,000 years. So now I'm looking at 100,000 years of landscape evolution of that block uplift, and I'm adding an uplift component too, so I'm continuing to uplift that block. I mean, we can argue about if the Tibetan plateau continues to uplift, but just let's ignore that for a second. Let's say the Tibetan plateau is uplifting, and, uh, and we have margins, so there, is, there are no plateau rims. We have rivers that can, that can drain. Then we are evolving this kind of a landscape. You see the channels being formed here. Um, uh, uh, the center part is still being at high, at high elevations. And if we look at the drainage network, so this is essentially the drainage network that is evolving here, um, um, where the channels are. 
uh, uh, incising, and from here we could do then the log area log slope plot, and so on. Okay, so that was a um, hundred thousand times, a uh, hundred thousand years in a thousand time step. Uh, so it went incredible fast. So we can really model larger landscapes uh, on the desktops uh, to do a, to do it fairly uh, rapidly. Okay, so my suggestion now is um, we want to explore Hilfe, bless you. We want to explore uh, the fastscape eroder uh, better. And uh, you want to have a model domain maybe of a thousand times a thousand pixels uh, with um, uh, you can do uh, 50 meter uh, uh, pixel size, yeah, and uh, you do uh, DT a thousand years, and uh, you do time steps also a thousand, meaning we are emulating a million years, okay? So that, that will be that will be the idea. We are we are generating something for a million years, and then let's say we have an uplift rate um, of uh, yeah, let's say zero point uh, uh, five millimeters. Okay, that's between one centimeter and one millimeter, and our k value should be 10 to the minus 4. Um, uh, um, okay, uh, so the idea will be that you look at the code. The code is called um, uh, land block uplift underscore FSE for fanscape eroder. Uh, you familiarize yourself with it and you generate your own version with these parameters up there. M over N stays at the same at the same uh, value. Okay. If you have any questions uh, or concerns, let me know. I'm setting this up myself here. You know, maybe first experiment with what is available in the code before you do the uh, the larger uh, uh, the larger domain, and then we can explore some of those things uh, uh, in more detail.
is on there. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, well, we would then need to go to import. Then work. We, we find it out tomorrow. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we would go then to uh, import. And then um, hopefully we can then export it if you go to export. Yeah, yeah, good question. Good question. Let's see it now. Okay, okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all. <laughs> It's, uh, it's the clip comprises um, uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Yeah, um, uh, the, the mirror. Yeah, no, 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 this is uh, it's the Spiegel. Also, um, these these three Schiffe, die hier runtergehen, sind die Mirror. Also, this is one of the vertical. Kann ich gleich zeigen, wie man das macht. Ja? Ja. So I just wanted to point one thing out. I just someone noticed just that the uh, uh, flow accumulation grid is flipped. Um, um, so in other words, uh, if you want to compare your topography with the flow accumulation grid, uh, you need to add uh, flip up down. So which means that you're flipping uh, the the, um, um, the flow accumulation grid because it is shown essentially from the bottom to the top, but you want to rotate it. Uh, uh, so, or mirror. So the command um, would be uh, NT flip up down, and then uh, you flip the entire matrix up down. So up down just rotates it on the, uh, along the x axis. Okay, and then the the resulting uh, uh, the resulting grid uh, 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 would correspond to the topography that you're looking at. Yeah, that's just as a
Well, because usually if it's the same as geodip images, they're being usually written from the bottom left corner. 